it is my immense pleasure to invite you all to a great session that we have planned about perimenopause. And uh, before we begin, before I introduce our speaker for the evening, I would like to thank the Mayo Girls Alumni Association for organizing this event. And uh, I would like to tell you all a little bit about myself. My name is Ria and I am uh, a therapist. I'm a counselor and a sexuality educator. So for the past uh, six years, I have worked with populations of all ages and all genders uh, and come to the conclusion that the only question that we start having when we grow up is the same question that we have at any given age. The only thing that changes perhaps the follow-up questions. And so, which is what makes a conversation like this so much more important, which makes a conversation like this so much more interesting. And uh, I would like to express a little bit of disappointment that it's only women joining in and not the fact that we also have partners, siblings who also oh. need a kind of education on how to support us better, how to understand us better, and most importantly, how to not ask, are you on your period? Is it not happening properly? Uh, so anyway, let's introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, so we have today with us uh, Ankita Tandan. Ankita okay. is a nutritionist who is dedicated to helping Achim, others. Achim, Achim, Achim. Her passion for Achim, wellness Achim. specialize in functional Achim, medicine. Achim. She works with clients dealing with issues like gut problems, hypothyroidism, hormone imbalance, and skin issues from a root cause perspective. Ankita's goal is not only to provide guidance, but also to motivate, educate, and empower people to take control of their health. It is so lovely to have you with us, Ankita. Over to you. Thanks so much, Ria, for that really, really warm welcome. Um, so I'm just going to start to share my slide. Uh, just give me one moment. You guys see it? Yes. I think I'm sharing a wrong slide. Just, just give me two minutes to navigate this. Please take your time. <clears throat> All right. Is it visible, guys? Yep. All right. So um, I'm going to start uh, with the presentation. So uh, navigating perimenopause and strategies for a smooth transition. So um, when we talk about menopause, it really is having a moment right now with so many amazing practitioners really trying to give information uh, as much as they can over the social medias or over their websites or podcasts. And we often talk about it as a moment in time, but it really is a movement. So I'm excited to talk all about it and we're going to get into the slides. Uh, Ria has already uh, introduce me so we'll move further so uh, let's lay some groundwork and connect the dots on what's really going on in the body and how the changes as a woman we go uh, uh, as sorry and how the changes as women go through this transition um, so perimenopause is typically six to ten years transitional period that happens before the day of menopause. And menopause is actually just a singular day, believe it or not. So the keynote here that it creates system wide uh, symptoms and we're going to talk about them because they are very, very important. Uh, we often talk about the night sweats, the hot flashes, the brain fog, the weight gain and the insomnia. And that's about it. But perimenopause transition is so much deeper. 
um, than that. And we have to think about it as a long-term game. And these changes can happen in the late 30s and into the early 50s. While technically, by definition, there are two stages when it comes to perimenopause. One is an early stage and one is a late stage. But a lot of women are in this gray area, which is a sort of term with this amazing doctor I follow, Dr. Kerry Jones, and she calls it the middle stage. Um, so it's important to know where you are. I mean, it is, it is, it is not uh, that you should know it, but it sort of helps you navigate through knowing where you are in your transition. So let's understand early per perimenopause. Uh, uh, so Ankita, can I just stop you? Are you changing the slides? Because we still see only the cover slide. Are you moving down in the presentation? Oh, yes. Yeah, it, it's, it was only kind of paused on the cover slide. Just give me a moment. We tried this earlier and it was working just fine. I'll try it again. I think this is the right of passage for any Zoom meeting. There have to be a couple of That's all yeah. to realize. I'm not it. The actual uh, sharing it, it just doesn't happen. Okay, I'm going to try it again. <clears throat> Do you see the first slide, Navigating Perimenopause? Yeah, we see the first. You see the second? Now it's moving. Yeah, we see you. All right, so okay. I'm going to jump right to the third slide and take it okay. from the starting so right. from the perimenopause right now it's okay. working yeah it's working it's working awesome so um perimenopause is typically a six to ten years transitional period that happens before the day of menopause and when we talk about menopause it is a singular day in time believe it or, believe it or not so the keynote here is that it creates a lot of system-wide symptoms and we're going to talk about them because of course those are really important uh, we often talk about the common symptoms like the night sweats hot flashes brain fog weight gain insomnia and i think the conversation just sort of stops there where nobody is making a sort of connection but perimenopause transition is so much deeper than that and we also have to kind of think about it as a long term game so these changes can happen in the late 30s into the early 50s while technically by definition there are two stages the early and the late stage of perimenopause but a lot of women are in this sort of a gray area called the middle age so it's really important to know where you are in your transition you, you you'll have better expectations uh, if you know that part so early menopause is when you're starting to get some symptoms but specifically what happens is that women will still get their period uh, if she has her uterus and she has her ovary and uh, but she would start to see some changes in her cycle by about seven days. Usually what happens is that the cycle is starting to get shorter and then it will start to get longer. So that is the next stage, uh, the late uh, stage perimenopause, when now she's full on skipping cycles and she goes 60 or more days without a cycle. Then comes that gray area, the middle range where you are, uh, it's not like you are seven days early or you're 14 days late and you're not like skipping periods by 60 days. So somewhere in between, right? But uh, she's having symptoms and the hormones are starting to change. And so what happens is that these stages help you identify where you are in your perimenopausal journey. Next is menopause. Menopause is really the day the woman has not had her period for 12 consecutive months. So assuming she hasn't had her hysterectomy or the uterus removed. So the average age of uh, menopause is about 51 and 52 years old. And women can have hormonal symptoms up to this point and beyond. And uh, what we call early menopause is about 45 years of age. Then we have the post-menopause after that day where you have uh, missed your period for an entire length of 12 months. You have the post-menopause. And this is the rest of the time after menopause. So month 13 all the way to rest of your life. She is considered post-menopause. And this could be two decades, three decades, four, de four decades, meaning she could be living a significant portion of her life post-menopause. 
Then we have surgical menopause, and this is an immediate menopause and uh, post menopause because she's had her ovaries removed, right? So, ovaries are responsible for making our sex hormones, and now we have no ovaries. So, you immediately go into menopause and then post menopause, all right? So, uh, what's important here is that, uh, like I said, depending upon her lifespan and her age at menopause, she's going to be spending a whole lot of time here, close to one third to a half of her life post menopause, which is why it is so important that we have to optimize leading into perimenopause itself. So you can have a great transition into postmenopausal time frame. And this is not so much about how long she's going to live, but it is more about how healthy or robust or able she's going to be living in that time frame. So now the think about um, um a second. So now the thing about uh, perimeno or postmenopause is that it is not a disorder or a disease. All women go through this and there is no way you can prevent it. So let's understand what's happening. This is a graphic that explains what's really going on with our hormones throughout our lifespan. So as you can see in the initial, the graphic initially shows a woman going into her puberty, which you can see is pretty like you can see the estradiol by the pink line and the progesterone with the blue line. And you can see it's a little chaotic and it's wonky, right? Like that is how the cycle in the earlier years and then in between we have the reproductive years and you can see that it's pretty consistent with the estrogens going up and down and the progesterones going up and down and then we transition out at the other end and if you think of it it's like a reverse puberty so as we see we have progesterone falling the blue lines are starting to fall sooner and the estrogens kind of going wild for a while in perimenopause. So, um, and until we get to the late perimenopause and then postmenopause, then everything goes down and low. I don't think we get, uh, you know, we get this explained to us very, you know, very much. And women are going through symptoms and are told that this happens, you're just getting old or you're just stressed or, you know, if they're having sort of depressive and anxiety symptoms, they're rather given an antidepressant. Nobody is actually really explaining physiologically that this is what is happening in your body. All right. So this is a, a, a sort of a representation of a hormonal roller coaster. So uh, so if you get your period every month, this roller coaster is the same month after month and year after year, un unless she's pregnant or something else is going on. So what happens in a reproductive age is that the estrogens are rising in the follicular phase and then it drops and then the progesterone is rising in the luteal phase. And this is a very sort of set roller coaster ride. But in perimenopause, things will start to go off the rails and all of a sudden you're on a totally different roller coaster and you often feel it with all of these different symptoms that are happening so these are the most common symptoms the typical ones um, that we hear all the time things like fatigue uh, you're feeling tired all the time the pms is getting worsened we're having changes or we're feeling feeling depressive or feeling anxious because there are periods that are totally shifting longer cycles smaller cycles that weight gain, especially that weight gain around that, you know, the stomach area and the abdomen, the visceral fat, the sleep problems, we're waking up through the night, not being able to sleep, there's moodiness, there's dryness, brain fog, night sweats. So these are more of the typical symptoms. But then she's also reporting other symptoms like heart, pal heart palpitations and itchy ears and random joint pains and muscle pains and, you know, phantom smells like you're more sensitive to smells if you're the person in that room. TMJ where you have this stiff jaw uh, and dry mouth and two DK and burning tongue. Um, but nobody is really connecting these symptoms to uh, perimenopause. And, you know, these issues will sort of get siloed, you're having heart palpitations, go to a cardiovascular doctor, you're having itchy ears, go show it to an ENT. So, you know, um, nobody is really like asking the right questions, maybe considering what age they're at or asking them, you know, how are your periods looking like? What are the symptoms you have? All right. Um, so why does this happen? I mean, 
women are born with finite amount of follicles in her ovary and what happens is that they decline in number as we're going through uh, you know as we're aging and that is happening through something called as natural cell death um, over time what happens is that these follicles they stop reacting to the brain hormones which is the FSH and the LH like they used to and the hormones will start to go down and symptoms will start to increase. So like we discussed perimenopause is like a reverse puberty so remember all the chaos going in all of the systems in the body were earlier on boarding and now a lot of them are off boarding and remodeling just like this house so this is an analogy of a home remodeling. And you know when the house finishes it's going to be great end but we have to get there so as it's a stressful and a giant pain and it's costly and that can very much feel like this perimenopausal transition time you know we have to get to the other end but it is kind of hard and stressful and all of those symptoms are constantly uh, you know weighing us down so historically perimenopause focused on hot flashes and brain fog with changing reproduction at its core right uh, and but we know that it is much more than that and that is what I'm excited to continue to talk about um, so according to research uh, depending upon who you ask there are over 100 signs and symptoms of perimenopause and menopause there are over these uh, 12 systems in the body and the perimenopausal transition can negatively impact all of them if you're not proactive about it. So as women go through this transition, they often report a lot of issues in these systems, but they get siloed and sent to various specialists and they're told, we don't know what's happening. Everything looks fine in your labs. We don't know what to do when in fact, there is so much we can do. So it, uh, like I said, the, uh, the menopausal transition can negatively impact all of these systems. So uh, this is a great graphic. Uh, so in 2023, a great uh, menopausal researcher, Andrea Donsky, interviewed more than 3,000 peri- and postmenopausal women. And she wanted to find out the top 10 symptoms that they reported in their own words. So these are the top 10 symptoms that women reported. And now if you see nine out of 10 have to do with the brain, apart from the joint pain, that is the only one which is not. So as women are going through this perimenopause transition, brain health really goes into the forefront. <clears throat> Okay, so Dr. Eve Henry gives this analogy of the four horsemen or the four horsewomen as we, so as we transition in a healthy way, we have to make sure we are reducing. So these are four major risk factors for women in perimenopause and menopause. First is the risk of cancer. Second is cardiovascular disease. Uh, third is neurodegenerative disease and the fourth is diseases of frailty, things like osteo osteopenia and osteoporosis. So we have to make sure we're thinking about our longe longevity and our health span. So, I um, mean, it's hard to have a conversation about brain health, uh, considering that nine out of 10 symptoms that were reported were to do with the brain. So it's hard to have a conversation around brain health without really talking about the gut. So uh, it is estimated that the microbial cells, so if we understand our human gut microbiome, we have almost 30 trillion bacteria living, uh, and that could be viruses and fungi and uh, bacteria and parasites, right? So uh, we have the microbial cells in the human body that exist at a one is to one ratio with human cells. I mean, we literally have around two to three pounds of bacteria in our gut. And we're not just carrying them without a reason. They live in us, we feed them, and they give us benefits. So now through this number of microbial genes uh, sort of outnumbers the human gene at the ratio of more than 100 is to 1, uh, reflecting that we have a really vast genetic microbiome. Um, so uh, if you 
if you want to like have a take home message, it is more like be nice to your microbiome because the bacteria in the gut takes over and rises up. They will win because they are exponentially more genes. So we have to take really good care of our microbiome so that it can take really good care of us. So let's talk about where does the gut health start? It obviously starts in the mouth. All right. So now let's connect it to menopause and mouth health. Um, as we can see, we're seeing uh, possible symptoms like dry mouth, burning tongue, gum changes, tooth loss. So we definitely have to keep on top of our oral health in peri and post menopause. So why does this happen? Turns out that the decline in estrogens can reduce saliva production. It can increase periodontal issues like gingivitis, periodontitis, and even bone loss, not just in our bones, but also in our teeth, because our teeth is also part of the skeletal structure. And so you definitely have to be more diligent about your dental health at this stage. And the last weird symptom that pops up here is TMJ, uh, which uh, is a uh, uh, sort of related to the decline in estrogen and it could look like clenching or you know jaw tightness so how do we support the mouth this is absolutely no surprise i think we're all aware a daily routine oral hygiene regular teeth brushing morning and at night uh, be mindful of disinfectant uh, mouthwashes because we also have a microbiome in our mouth, not just in our gut. Actually, we have different microbiomes on our skin, in our nasal cavity, in our mouth, in our gut, in our vagina. So uh, we really have to be careful of these uh, mouthwashes, right, that can kill the good bacteria. So um, those should be avoided. Uh, flossing regularly, I usually suggest uh, people to do a floss rather than the string floss. Tongue scraping is great. Um, seeing your dentist regularly, check if you have any sort of um, cavities or root canals that are starting to pop up at this time. Obviously, get evaluated for mouth breathing. This could uh, lead to mouth dryness and also it's very inflammatory for the body. Healthy nutrition, um, absolutely, you should be making sure you're eating less of the sugars, less of the processed foods, packaged foods, and eating more real nutrient dense foods and supporting gut health like I, I think I've seen it in a couple of people where they have a really bad gut health they also have a really bad dental health and if you have a bad dental health then you're you know we're, we're like taking in the saliva so many times in the day we're passing on those bacteria down in the stomach and into our gut microbiome so uh, let's understand how do hormones affect our gut microbiome uh, a lot of women will start to experience new food sensitivities at this time, uh, might have heartburn or gas and bloating all the time, their bowel movements are off. Um, and uh, as we can see, the gut microbiome is a really diverse place, right? It likes diversity, even in terms of the bacteria and even in terms of what we're eating. So diversity in our diet. Uh, what we have in our microbiome, it seems according to research that estrogen and progesterone help maintain our gut barrier. You know, we often talk about leaky gut. So that is the barrier that can become leaky when we have decline in these hormones. And now it is more susceptible to be becoming leaky. And as you can see in this image I put here, we have these microbial population inside our gut and they release toxins and those can get out into the bloodstream and cause inflammation. Um, so if we don't have adequate levels of these hormones, we are susceptible uh, to be having a leaky gut. And I think uh, there is so much we can do about this gut microbiome to stop this leaky gut from happening. Um, my, uh, menopausal hormone decline and leaky gut. So as I, as I just mentioned, leaky gut causes inflammation, uh, which goes in the whole body. Uh, as lower uh, estrogen levels also lowers the microbial diversity. So making sure we're eating plant fibers, we're eating uh, 
foods rich in probiotics, things like sauerkraut or kimchi or kanji or kombuchas or a homemade pickles that can all be beneficial here. Um, and this microbiome, guys, it's so important. Like there, I don't think there is a body, uh, there is a system in the body that it doesn't affect, right? Um, they, it also makes things like serotonin and dopamine. So when, you know, when somebody is having an issue in their gut microbiome, they usually will also have sort of mood issues happening side by side. And then the next thing is that when we have a leaky gut, we're not absorbing nutrients and uh with the lower diversity of these microbes in the gut uh, that are responsible for making vitamins like vitamin B2 and B2 and they're not and with the loss in absorption we're also becoming at a higher risk of bone loss because now we're not absorbing our calcium and our magnesium and all of the minerals uh, uh, that are required for the production um, that are required uh, in the bone uh, for bone health. So this is a medical research paper throwing light on the mucosal layer, which starts to deplete as our estrogens and progesterone levels uh, decline. As you can see here, we have a nice thick layer in the beginning. And as we're going from uh, early perimenopause to menopause and then later, this layer is just starting to decline. So uh, it's, it's really important. We're like paying a lot more attention to our gut health and being really proactive about it. Next is uh, many women use phytoestrogens, uh, things like soy. I think we all have heard of that soy can be beneficial, tofu can be beneficial, edamame or other derivatives of uh, soy that are available in the form of uh, supplements. Uh, because phytoestrogens, they behave like weak estrogens, especially at a time in perimenopause where we have a decline in estrogens. Um, they can bind weakly to the estrogen receptors and give us that slight estrogenic effect. But here's the fun part, you know, when we eat a certain food, a bacteria also breaks it down, it metabolizes it. So especially when we're talking about phytoestrogens and isoflavones like soy, and you know, there are lots of other things, fancy words like red clover and all. Um, but we need the bacteria and the gut to be able to break down these isoflavones into something called as S equal uh, and which is the strongest um, which can have the strongest estrogenic active uh, but the funny thing is that more than half of the human population is unable to make this S equal due to the lack of uh, the beneficial bacteria in their gut I do have a bonus tip for you all. I mean, this wouldn't be a, a happy one, I think, for most uh, people here. But uh, drinking alcohol, and especially uh, if you women have noticed that you're not able to handle your alcohol at this time uh, in your perimenopausal or menopausal state, uh, is because it does cause a lot of stress on the body. So this is a research on how the uh, drinking alcohol affects the body's microbiome. So that's a lot about microbiome. Where do we start? <clears throat> it's important we're chewing our food. So digestion is in the mouth. It's really important to, to chew our foods and do really tiny itty bitty pieces. Um, not drinking water with our meals because that dilutes our gastric juices and really taking time to eat a meal in peace and doing some sort of breathing deep breathing because digestion is a process that is activated when we're relaxed okay next is that if you are chronically dealing with any sort of these symptoms gas bloating heartburn constipation diarrhea stomach ache um, it's important that you're working with a practitioner who knows what is going on and is able to address all of these um, issues think of it like you know we have a broken down car and now the wheels come off and they are fallen apart uh, it's going to be much harder to get the car together when the wheels are just sort of starting to shake so address things sooner than later because once you are going deeper into that transition things do get harder like we see that how the estrogens and progesterone affect our gut microbiome in a big way 
um, diversify your diet, right? Like we have these trillions of bacteria and they like variety. So think of a rainbow, try to bring in different colors, try to bring in different plant foods, um, you know, nuts and seeds and different vegetables that, you know, you because I think we're all creature of habit for the most part, we're eating the same thing, you know, daily or if we're going out to our favorite restaurants, we're ordering the same thing to try and bring in something new into your diet. Limit use of antimicrobials. Um, also reduce exposure, things like mouthwashes. We spoke about that. Antimicrobial soaps because it's killing the good bacteria. Lotions that would have preservatives, um, huh? packed food and packaged foods. Yeah. That is... Uh, that has preservatives as we know the job of preservatives is to kill bacteria what is it doing in our body it is also going to kill that bacteria in the gut um, pesticides herbicides i mean this is a hard one uh, but try to eat organic as much as possible and also uh, be very mindful about your use of antibiotics um, and it can totally uh, wreak hav havoc on our gut it doesn't e it doesn't just kill um, the bad bacteria but it's also killing the good bacteria to really having sort of strategies when you're taking antibiotics to make sure you are bringing in a good probiotic and then supplementing with it for a long time um feed your gut microbiome definitely all of the plants you know the foods the fibers the rainbow that is going to act like the prebiotics that is the food for your bacteria and probiotics is the bacteria itself so absolutely bring in the food i think that is more beneficial rather than just adding in a probiotic and even a uh, probiotic it's really important you are educated around that and i think that is a really deep topic maybe we can have a conversation around that another day um so that is that for our gut um, moving on to cardiometabolic health. Um, I mean, women in their menopausal or perimenopausal time do have uh, issues with their lipids and suddenly their, um, you know, the lipid profile and the cholesterol are all starting to rise. Um, and that is, again, with the decline in the hormone, the decline in the estrogens can do that. A lot of women of cardiovascular disease what can we do about it and even our metabolic health you know we're like we feel we're putting on weight we're getting uh, more of that apple shape from that pear shape and all of the visceral fat that is going in um in our belly area so what do we do about it so if there is going to be one takeaway from this presentation you're going to take today it should be support your blood sugars okay so by that what i mean is that most, uh, you know, most of our diets uh, typically are very rich in carbohydrates, you know, all of the things like rice or bread or rotis or noodles or pasta, and we're really not focusing on our protein intake. So make sure you're starting your breakfast with a nice protein and fiber rich, so you can have some sort of sorted vegetables on the side and some eggs or doing like a basin moong dal chila with lots of veggies. Um, so make sure you're starting your day with a protein and fiber rich breakfast. Uh, and this is because as we wake up in the morning, if we, you know, feed ourselves with high carb foods like po we're eating a banana first thing in the morning we're raising our blood sugars okay and then what happens is that once we have gone on to that roller coaster of high blood sugar the body in all its possibilities <laughs> try to bring it down maintain that balance and then that whole, uh, roller coaster of blood sugar continues all right so uh, this is like starting your day on a good note is really important it's also really important that we are waking up and eating within the first two hours because uh, that is another stress for the body. And during this time, the body is any which way is going through so many stressors with the hormonal changes and a lot of the systems in the body, like I said. So how do we try to reduce that stress? So in terms of blood sugar, this is really, really important. How much protein we should be eating? I think most people are confused about this. So uh, around 1 to 1.5 gram times your body weight. Okay, if you're working out and you're doing heavy lifting and strength training, then somewhere around 1.5 grams. If you're not doing that, which I highly encourage you 
to do that than uh, around one uh, gram. Uh, while I do talk about protein intake, I think it. Uh, I have to also talk about digestion uh, because if your digestion is suffering or you're having a tough time digesting proteins, then this is not going to work. So we have to make sure, number one, the gut health is good, the diet, the, you're able to break down your proteins and then start increasing the protein slowly and eventually. Fiber, uh, 35 grams of fiber for per day. Uh, use this app called My Fitness Pal. You can also use Healthify Me and try inputting your meals for at least seven days to sort of understand what is the trend, you know, how many uh, carbs are you getting? How much proteins are you getting? How much fiber are you getting? How much fat are you getting? And you'll actually be surprised if you do that because um, like I said, we really have to uh, be more proactive about bringing in those proteins because it does, uh, you know, require a lot of planning as to how we're going to be managing that amount through the day. Uh, next thing I talk about is reduced toxin exposure. And uh, some common things that came to my mind are perfumes. I mean, the perfume industry is doesn't disclose how many toxins and chemicals uh, are going into the perfumes and we're using it directly into onto our skin. And skin is basically absorbing everything and it is going into our bloodstream. Uh, candles, we're burning candles and suddenly we're having this headache um, and the body is like full of toxins, especially if we're living in, you know, metro cities like Delhi or Mumbai where you know we have so much of pollution and so much of toxins in our food and personal care products and if and you know if we were to consider and talk about a typical woman I mean if we were to count the couple of products she may be using starting from the face wash and the shampoos and the conditioners and I know this can be very overwhelming but I still uh, do want you guys to be more educated around this that toxins do not have a place in our body and they do cause issues in our cardio, metabolic health, as well as, of course, they are overburdening the liver and they're also causing major dysregulations in our hormonal areas. And even household items, you know, all of the liquid detergents and the hand washes. So I would say start somewhere, uh, start slow and uh, make it a you know sort of a process in progress one thing i forgot to add here is uh, the utensils and the cookware that we're using so eliminate uh, any of the um the non-stick pans uh, or the aluminium pans or the kadais i think the good metals to be using is stainless steel or we're using a nice uh, iron utensil like a cast iron utensil um Next point is weight training. I think we we must have heard this enough, but it really, really is important. We have to start working on our muscle because muscle is what increases our metabolism. Muscle is what protects our bones. Um, muscle is really, really important. So if you can start already working out slowly, maybe three to four times a week, that would be amazing. Um, and of course, start working on your protein intakes. And no, you're not going to get bulky, you're not going to become that big, huge person. If you do this around one to 1 1.5 grams of protein, and you know, do weight lifting for three to four times a week. Um, hearing about this zone two activity a lot, which is actually when we are doing 65% of our maximum heart rate, this is a little bit, a uh, little intense than just walking. So it could be walking on an incline, running and walking, sort of doing a combination where you are running for a minute and then you're walking for two minutes and then slowly you can increase the running and the walking intervals. Uh, cycling and even a stationary bike. Um, these really help in, um, you know, burning um, that fat and uh, sort of uh, helping us with uh, producing weight as well. <clears throat> for our brain health uh, we saw how the brain goes uh, you know brain health goes into the forefront with so many women 
uh, in the survey who reported that they had so many of those brain symptoms. What are the important things we could be doing for our brain? So omega-3 fats, uh, especially DHA, our brain is 20% made up of these DHAs. So uh, if we're eating fish, which I don't think we're eating on a daily basis, but even if we are, we are eating it, it's hard to get those 1000 mg of EPA and DHA from that fish. I would highly recommend you're using a high quality omega-3 supplement because um, if you're not using good quality omega-3s, most of the times these oils are very, very delicate. They have to be stored well. Uh, they have to be shipped in a particular way. And if the brand is not doing that, uh, then possibly we could be eating a supplement which is already oxidized and that is further adding to that oxidative stress in the body. So a high quality supplement, omega-3 fat is really important. B vitamins are amazing for the brain. They protect our neurons, they protect our myelin sheath, um, they can protect us really from all of the degenerative, uh, brain degenerative diseases. Uh, you know, that that may or may not. Uh, magnesium supplements. Magnesium is one of an important, very, very important uh, mineral that is involved in more than 300 enzymatic processes in the body. So magnesium is a great one. And creatine. I think when uh, we think or talk about creatine, we're always um, connecting it with muscle building. Yes, absolutely. It helps with that. But creatine is really having its moment uh, with brain health and uh, it can really help in energy production. So anyone who's having any sort of ne uh, neurodegenerative diseases, they're really um, running a lot of uh, clinical trials uh, with creatine and seeing what are the changes they are seeing in those people. Optimizing sleep. And uh, this this could be a hard one for a few people. I mean, as they're already struggling, they're not able to sleep or they're not getting sleep or they have this really chat chattering mind uh, at like 10 and 11 and they're feeling wired and tired. But uh, optimizing sleep is really, really important. And it is not same as sleeping from 1 a.m. to uh, so 1 a.m. to 10, uh, 8 a.m. Um, because we do have, you know, certain cycles that run in our body of restoration, detoxification. So the idle time, if you'd ask me, it is from 10 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, and it has to be somewhere around seven to eight hours at minimum of sleep. Next is setting your circadian rhythm, uh, which means sort of having a... Uh, uh, you know, like mimicking the rhythms of the day. So as you wake up, you should be exposing yourself to the sunlight, get some sunshine. Uh, the idea is that we're mimicking the day. So as, as the sun is out, we're like exposing ourselves to bright light. And as it's evening and it's a sunset, then we're kind of getting into this dim light and uh, sort of again mimicking the night environment. Increasing blood, fl blood flow to the brain, uh, that is again very, very important because the blood is carrying the oxygen, the nutrients uh, to the brain and a little bit of a aerobic activity like jumping in a place or just doing a short sprint will help with that. Even massages, zone two activity can help with that as well. We already spoke about zone two. Strength training also has its research uh, on how it's really important for the brain health. Of course, this is no surprise meditation, deep breathing, um, it stimulates our vagus nerve, it's really also very good for our gut health, not just for our brain health. Um, the lipids, uh, as, as we spoke about, um, perimenopausal time is the time with the estrogens declining, the cholesterol does tend to rise, all right? So really making sure you're running your lipid panels um, and cholesterol usually rises in response to inflammation in the body. So really figuring out where that inflammation is coming from because if we do have higher cholesterol levels in the blood, it is going to cause a uh, blockage in that blood flow to the heart to the brain and that is where we're seeing a higher uh, symptomology or a sort of um, uh, an issue with the cardiovascular health as well as the brain health um, 
antioxidant rich foods um so these are foods that are rich uh, in of course uh, antioxidants and uh, things like berries and uh, lemons and limes and vitamin c rich foods and vitamin e from the nuts and the seeds think of a rainbow the more the colors you get in the more of the phytonutrients and the antioxidants you're getting from them and last one is healthy social connections and this is absolutely no surprise make sure the person you're connecting with is making you feel good and is not making you feel low in any way this also goes for social media accounts i think if you're following any sort of negative accounts and giving you that sort of negative feeling it even goes for what sort of um news are we watching are we really putting in all of that fear in our body or what are we watching on netflix so be mindful about this part Next, we have the optimizing of the adrenal health. So once we go into the perimenopause and the menopausal time, the adrenals, which are like two little glands on top of the kidneys, they take over the production of estrogens and progesterones. So it's really important we're taking care of our adrenal health. So the biggest uh, uh, driver that can, um, you know, make the adrenals uh, dysfunctional is stress. So managing chronic stress. If you are going through a uh, you know, stressful time, is it's a stressful job, it's a stressful relationship, tries the different ways to manage that and be more resilient about it. Um, HIIT, <clears throat> extreme workouts, are extremely stressful to the body and can deplete adrenal health. Um, so really listen to your body as to how you feel. You know, if, 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 you know, you'd compare in my thirties, I did this kind of workout and I could just do it, but now I'm not able to do it and I don't feel great about it. I think your body does give you a lot of signals, whether things are working out or not. Intermittent fasting. This is really interesting. A lot of women like to do this, but, um, the, what we need to understand is that so much of research is done, done around intermittent, intermittent fasting and it has been done on men, okay? Um, but men are not going through this transition, you know, they don't have these uh, periods and they don't have estrogens and progesterone rising and falling, right? And they're not going through this perimenopausal transition. So it isn't nearly the same, Um like I said, the body is going through a stressful period and you don't want to be burning your candle on both ends. So uh, see if this intermittent fasting is working for you. Um, we probably have to prepare our body to be able to get into, be able to take this extra stress, you know. Um, make sure your blood sugars are fine. Make sure you're digesting well. Make sure there isn't inflammation in the body. And then think about doing intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting usually works better for postmenopausal women rather than people in perimenopause. Adrenal cocktail, these are just drinks I the uh, which are rich in vitamin K, vitamin C and minerals. And these are all the things that our adrenal glands need. And even B vitamins can be great for the adrenal glands. Um, the option that I like to make and share with my client population is we can make it having using a coconut water, which is rich in potassium. Um Sorry, it was not vitamin K, it was potassium, the first one. So uh, coconut water, which is rich in potassium, add like a whole lemon to it. So a lot of vitamin C and add a nice heavy pinch of pink salt. Um, and if you're feeling sort of run down and anytime you're craving that coffee, maybe try this. It really uplifts in that moment and you probably won't have to go for that, uh, you know, a coffee or a muffin or anything at that point. Um, manage internal stressors. I mean, it's not always about external relationship, job stressors. We also have internal stressors, things like um, dysfunctional blood sugars, uh, infections, uh, possibly chronic infections in the gut or parasites, um, or having uh, anemias. Even that is a stressor for the body. Having toxins and not having the capacity to detox and inflammation, which truly is the you know root driver for a lot of chronic issues. 
So here are some acute symptoms and supplements. Um, I really couldn't uh, generalize. I mean, I try to make it as generalized because a lot of things have to be bio-individualized uh, according to what is really going on and then sort of work out the therapeutic supplementation plan. Um, but for night sweats, hot flashes, anxiety, we could use things like chase tree berry. This is called Vitex. B6, uh, you can use a B-complex or even use B6 separately but make sure you're checking your blood labs. Uh, vitamin C uh, in a high dosage like 1000 mg. Maca root. This is, uh, there is an amazing herb. Uh, maca, I think it comes from uh, uh, South America. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have this brand here in our country, but there is this brand called Feminescence and they make different markers according to different stages of your periods or perimenopause or postmenopause and you can take this mark yeah. and they also have done some re research studies as to how it helps in sort of increasing estrogen levels in the body if you're unable to sleep at night or you have a chattering mind you could try GABA this is uh, uh, some uh, it's a butric acid it's an amino acid uh, that really helps in calming the mind or even magnesium glycinate that could be really helpful uh, if you have chronic stress that you're dealing with adaptogens can be great because when we have stress we have our cortisol levels either shooting up or if we've been dealing through that stress for a really long time then they do um, plummet down and that could really make us feel like a lot of fatigue and low energy and able to get out of bed in the morning and all sort of things like that so ashwagandha and rhodiola these are two amazing adaptogens that can help us deal with the stress for bone health i think most women Women are supplementing with calcium, but uh, calcium does have its negative effects if you're especially doing high dose calcium for long periods of time. Um, so the thing is that uh, uh, we need cofactors, right? Our bone is not just calcium, it's a lot of minerals. But if you're really talking about the main minerals, there also are a bunch of combination uh, supplements, which I think are much more beneficial than individually only doing the calcium supplementation. So uh, for calcium, uh, we do need vitamin K too. Vitamin K is also made by our gut bacteria. We can also get it from our diet, but we can also supplement it along with vitamin D and K2 in combination. So K2 uh, helps us take those calcium that we have absorbed through our gut and it takes it to our structure, you know, our bones and our teeth. And it's not going to deposit it in our soft tissues like our arteries. So a lot of times we hear of calcification, right? Um, and the hardening of the arteries that can happen for a couple of things, a couple of reasons, but also calcium, uh, high dose calciums or high dose vitamin D can do that. Uh, managing internal stress, I think we already spoke about this earlier. Um, here are a couple of blood tests um, that you should be running. So a complete uh, blood count where we're looking, screening for some infections or anemias, liver and kidney function tests to really looking at the detoxification capacity for the body, fasting glucose, fasting insulin and HbA1c markers uh, because as we're going into the perimenopause, the body is naturally getting more insulin resistance. Um, so absolutely screening for this, uh, building on that muscle is makes us less insulin uh, uh, resistance. So it makes us uh, more insulin sensitive. Um, so always be screening for this marker, lipids, and specifically with APOA1 and APOB, this can be more appropriate to evaluate car cardiovascular risk rather than only doing the standard lipid panel. Uh, we should also be screening for thyroid, the entire panel, along with antibodies to check. This is the time a lot of people develop autoimmune conditions with the immune system uh, also being impacted with the decline in hormones or with the wonky hormones and the wonky estrogens. Um, so also be checking for Hashimoto's, which is very, very common and the 
biggest driver of hypothyroid vitamin d by vitamin b12 an entire iron panel because this is really important uh, to screen for anemias and we know that circulation is really important to take blood to our brains to our cells to be able to deliver those nutrients and oxygen um, to all different parts of our body homocysteine this again helps us screen for cardiovascular issues as well as it's uh, good to see how estrogens are being detoxed from the body and if we talk about a test for uh, menopause there isn't really any test that can help you but fsh uh, if the numbers are rising over time and you're going let's say above uh, 25 or a 30 or a 40 um it does say that you are either in menopause. It's more uh, so when we when a doctor is diagnosing um, perimenopause or menopause, it is mostly that they are going by the symptoms, by your periods, by your cycles and by your age. Those are the main uh, uh, sort of things that we're looking at for uh, diagnosing where you are in your journey. And the... The last slide I have here is that I found this video on uh, not able to play it. Okay. I found this video on one of this amazing um, educa educator. Uh, she's a doctor in the US, an OBGYN, and she is really talking about perimenopause and menopause. I think she's also published this book called The New uh, Menopause uh, with so much information that women need to know and hear about. So I saw this video on her page and I wanted to share this here with you guys. Oops. <clears throat> Um, and I'm, I'm unable, unable to play it, so I'm gonna try it. Do you wanna post the link in the chat window? Yeah, yeah um, we can. Let me just try it one more time. I'll try sharing the screen again. This is the hard part. I think I might just uh, share this video with you all later. Um, I'm, I'm unable to figure out. Yeah, let's get some questions in. I'm sure everybody's heard so much. So Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And so uh, I think we're going to start with questions. There are some that are on the chat box that I'm going to ask along with some FAQs. So when uh, I figured out that we were going to be doing this session, I thought that we'll do some very frequently asked questions. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk that's happening, especially about perimenopausal hormone testing, and it's it's a rather expensive panel. So do you think that that is something that everybody should consider getting checked? Um, I would say that, uh, at least in my practice, like, um, let's just go back to the presentation and we saw that graph, right, for the puberty and our reproductive years and our, you know, transitioning. So as we saw, there was always this up and down sort of a graph going, right? Uh, and especially when we're doing a blood test, what I'm trying to say is that it's not like a hose, with a flow of hormones, same at all times. They're constantly going up and down and up and down. So when we're doing a blood test, it's essentially a snapshot in that moment as to what was the hormone level at that point. It's really not giving you that um, right 
picture as to uh, where exactly your hormones are. Sure, they can give you some information, but they don't always give you the right information. So uh, um, uh, there is an advanced functional test, which is called the Dutch urine test. It's a urine test, as the name suggests. Uh, it's, uh, it is definitely an expensive test. Most of the functional tests are expensive. What that looks at is the metabolites. Metabolites meaning that, you know, we make all of these estrogens and progesterones in our body. Mm -hmm. and they, once they have done their job, they need to break down and then we excrete them out of our kidneys and out of our liver into our gut and all of those. So it's looking at what are the metabolites. And so that sort of gives us because that we're testing through the day four to five times in a day. So that is giving us a more accurate picture. It also shows us actually tons of information. It's giving us different estrogens. So there are three different kinds of estrogens. It's giving us two different kinds of progesterone. It's telling us about the testosterone and the DHT and cortisol. And so it's a pretty wholesome test. So coming back to your question, it might not always give you the right information. Perfect. Okay. And um, so one of the questions that are on the panel is that are there any early signs or symptoms that you think that women in their late 30s should watch out for as they approach perimenopause? Yeah, like I said, the the biggest sign that comes is your periods will start to shift. Um, yeah. And periods are going to get shorter by like, let's say, four days or three days and seven days. And you are going to be developing sort of more symptoms which are estrogen dominant because perimenopausal is a time where we're having initially higher estrogens and then it all starts to decline. Um, so signs that we could be looking out for are like, let's say hormonal headaches or we could be looking at tender breasts. We could be having a heavier period. We could be having having a uh, PMS that is worsening, uh, bigger mood changes, uh, putting on weight. Um, these are a couple of signs we could be looking at. Okay. And uh, like one of the things that you suggested was weight, was weight training. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that yoga or Pilates or something like that is a good enough substitute for something of this sort? No. It is not. It is unfortunately not. I mean, absolutely go for it. Try to do more of a combination. Like do walking every day. Try to bring in those zone two activities uh, at least three, four times in a week. Uh, and workouts, maybe do a day. Start with a day of weight training if it if that is something that doesn't, you know, call out to you. And why. So start sort of building on it slowly because the only way when you're going to be lifting muscles is when you're going to be lifting heavy, like really heavy. Sure, resistance is good. It is good. Body weight exercises are also good, but we're not going to be building a lot of muscle like that. Okay. And uh, so we spoke a lot about supplements and how there's a lot of those in the market, and but not all of them are as reliable. Are there any particular brands that you would suggest? To everybody for maybe omega-3 or rhodiola or anything else yeah i think uh, i use a lot of different brands for different things um i use a lot of brands from the u.s reason being i spoke about the quality and when it comes to quality um a lot of these amazing brands are doing third-party testing checking for heavy metals and toxins which unfortunately there aren't a lot of brands in india that are doing it i mean i do use this brand called healthy hay uh, for magnesium supplements and berberine supplements but omegas i would highly highly suggest you're only getting from a very reputable brand so no Nordic Naturals is one of them. Uh, they do really good uh, EPA and DHA supplement. Uh, go for the higher, like a 1250 mg combination of EPA and DHA. Don't go for like a 300 or a 400 or a 500 because that isn't going to be very helpful. For Ashwagandha, okay. definitely we can pick uh, uh, brands from India. Uh, even Healthy Hay does an amazing uh, Ashwagandha. Rhodiola, there is this brand called Gaia Herbs, G-A-I-A. -A. Uh, they do a really good Rhodiola. In fact, Gaia Herbs is good for most uh, herbal sort of supplements. They are really good in that. Perfect. And uh, is early menopause a problem? Absolutely. We we saw right how um 
so many systems are impacted when these hormones are declining. Um, so absolutely, all of those areas are going to get affected. Um, so it is going to start bringing in a lot more symptomology, a lot more changes in the body more early on. And that means you're living a rather significant part of your life in perimenopause and postmenopause. So absolutely, it is a problem, I would say. And uh, is pregnancy possible during this perimenopausal time? Well, I think it is. Um I'm not very sure how, uh, um, I mean, we really have to be more accurate around the age and the health and what is really going on in a lot of different areas. Uh, so really getting to have a full picture with the blood sugar, with the period health, uh, with the thyroid health, that would help uh, in further uh, narrowing it down to that answer. I mean, sort of hard to just say yes or no uh, to that question. And uh, by when you mentioned GABA, are we talking about GABA pentin? No, no, no. I'm talking about uh, it's. I will just share the name with you. It's GABA butyric acid, something like that. Perfect. And <laughs> um, so, is asparagus a good herb to be consumed during perimenopause? Which one? Asparagus. Asparagus. I have actually not heard of that. Asparagus, the vegetable. Yeah, it, it's written Shatavri. Shatavri, yes. Shatavri can help in hormonal balancing. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. And uh, I don't know about everybody who's listening, but I feel like being a woman's mighty tough. And the sad part is that you can't even have a drink about it, considering if you care about your microbiome. You can't, you can't. I mean, unfortunately, uh, there is a lot we can do, but it also requires us to be very proactive and really looking into what are the areas of our body that need work sooner than later. Like, of course, when your body is going to give up on you, you will be looking out for people who can help you out. But I would say when you are getting those signals, start there don't wait to be in that really like I gave that analogy of the car when the wheels are starting to shake get in touch with someone and do, I think the labs I shared in the end, make sure you're running them at least twice yearly or maybe once yearly if everything is looking good. If you feel more symptomatic, make sure you're running these labs uh, to really getting a look into your metabolic health, your cardiovascular. I mean, we're like covering so many systems. Uh, it's it, And it, that can also be more bio-individualized depending upon then. This is like more sort of a general panel that everyone should be doing. Absolutely. And do you think there are any vegetarian substitutes for omega-3? Yeah, I think there are algae, uh, algae uh, oils. Um, those could be used. I'm also forgetting. Um, yeah, algae comes to my mind right now. Maybe if I have more thoughts on that, I could share with one of you and then you could uh, share it. Or maybe I can post it on the community later. Perfect. Absolutely. Ria, can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. You know, one of the things you hear is, what's the big deal? Uh, our mothers went through it. There's nothing. But I feel like over the last 12 months, my body has just turned against me. Everything yeah. I try, my anxiety levels, I was not this anxious person at all. But everything seems to give me anxiety. Yeah. So what has changed? Why did our mothers not struggle with it? Why do some people around us never struggle with it? But for the rest of us, I could read every symptom and tell you yes 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 yeah yeah like i said you know um so when we're like getting into this menopausal post -menopausal, uh, menopausal uh time the hormones are completely like low and gone right and as we saw they are affecting our brain health our cardiovascular health so it really matters what were you doing you know 10 years before it happened were you sleeping enough? Were you eating a diet which was supporting your brain? Were you bringing in that workout? Were you taking care of your gut microbiome? So all of the things proceeding. So this is one. Um, the second thing is, of course, we're carrying the genes from our parents. And they lived a much cleaner life, I would say. They wouldn't be eating out so often. They wouldn't be sleeping late. They wouldn't be partying or, you know, all sort of things like that. So... 
that is or maybe it could also be women in that age were not very vocal about what was really going on with their bodies so and now we're like more educated we're becoming more aware of what is going on we know we can connect this to this system of the body like i said a lot of things get siloed out um so which is why you know this free work is so important for anyone leading you know it's it's like uh, you know a woman is trying for pregnancy i mean it's highly important that she's planning her week 0 which is like preparing her body for that pregnancy to have that healthy baby i mean i was reading this article where it said that the baby was born with 280 something chemicals in the umbilical cord at birth how did that baby get exposed it definitely came from the mother right so the mother offloaded all of her toxins into the baby right so similarly in a in a similar situation where we need to prepare our body for the pregnancy similarly we need to prepare the body for this big transition because if we do want to have that health span and that robust health later on it is much much important i feel like this session is all the more important especially for someone like me even though i mean i'm a couple years away but uh i don't know if this is interesting but i've already gone through induced menopause uh oh. which was which was quite a trip in uh, all the negative senses of the word and it was uh, quite difficult i mean hot flashes anxiety especially when you're undergoing treatment as it is and it's it's quite the journey and so thank you so much ankita this has been so informative this has been so necessary i'm sure everybody here feels similarly yeah. i think we've covered all questions if there are any others please feel free to put them on the chat and we'll wait for about 30 seconds and then we'll wrap up So while you wait, I'll ask another one. When will it end? Is there a timeline to you can say, okay, I'll be fifty-one and be done with it? I'm all cool to be here, so you can decide. No, no, not the. I I meant the menopause. Oh, can you say that the moment I turn fifty-one, then I can have my body back, my usual self back? Is there a timeline to when all this this is going to end? no there isn't unfortunately uh it does get better okay as you go into the menopausal part it does get better but it can continue for some portion of your life and let's say if uh the uh, let's say the bones are impacted already right uh, and you're going into that osteoporosis and osteopenia so it does actually get harder to make it better at that point with so much of changing systems in the body uh, but yes it will slightly start to get better but there isn't like you know we can say that as you hit menopause things are going to get better so you need to get evaluated do your labs really like look like look into what are the symptoms that are happening and how do we support it and sure for anxiety i think i mentioned gaba that is very helpful magnesium glycinate that is very helpful so basically uh why we have this anxiety when we go through this time is progesterone actually breaks into alpha and beta metabolites and the alpha uh progesterone metabolites they go into our brain and they activate our gaba receptors and now that's gone okay so it's just like you know when our insulin insulin levels plummet when somebody has diabetes they are given insulin right if somebody has thyroid they are given a thyroid hormone the levothyroxine but uh, now this is something new that is really coming up that when women are going through this time where the hormones are all over the place there's something called as hrt which is hormone replacement therapy um or bhrt which is bioidentical hormone replacement therapy which is bioidentical are very similar to the hormones we have in our body and that can really help you deal with those symptoms especially if you're somebody who's having very debilitating and extreme symptoms um uh, and you're not like sort of making it through the day and you're like fighting with your family and you're like i don't recognize myself and i hate myself and i hate my kids and there's dissociation like if you're really going into that side of things or aspects of things um i think really finding out um 
a doctor who is educated in HRT or BHRT is going to be really, really helpful. So there are like pellets and there are like creams and there are lots of things in the hormonal form that you can be using. And I'm by no way touching a birth control pill that is totally different. That is rather harmful for the body. Perfect. Uh, so as we wind up, I would like to thank the participants for joining in, for asking such thoughtful questions. I would like to thank the Mayo Girls Alumni Association once again. And most of all, I would really like to thank you, Ankita, for empowering and educating and supporting us women in more ways than one.